couple of years ago, I was sitting in a restaurant. It's a very nice Italian place. I mean, they had some lovely garlic bread. That's all I really remember. The food. No, wait, I tell a lie. I ordered a steak, but it came drenched in this sauce. I mean, the sauce was really nice, but why would you do that to a steak? Why, why, why would you pour sauce all over a steak? I mean, the steak came with spaghetti. Spaghetti and steak, that is what I ordered. Well, sober. And I'm, I, you know, I thought the sauce would be on, on the spaghetti, but it was on the steak and the pasta was bone dry. I, I don't get it. Anyway, not the point. So, I was at this restaurant with my boyfriend eating copious amounts of garlic bread because we were celebrating. And what we were celebrating was me getting 100 subscribers. 100 subscribers. That was, that was from my Laser Pick Talks tank video. I mean, that video was a lot of work. For those of you who weren't around back then, you know, and haven't dived into the Laser Pick archives, which are all in an unlisted playlist somewhere, I used to do gamer content. It's not that great. I mean, there is a reason it didn't do too well. God almighty! Oh! Christ! What did I eat? Oh, it's all coming out there! Oh, God! Oh! Oh, Harry! Terry, help me! Ah! God, I think I'm passing a kidney stone out of my asshole! But all that time, all that effort, it was a lot of effort, netted me 56 subscribers. So I decided to change, and this turned out to be a very good decision. Because now I have 300,000. <laughs> And now, rather than all the negative comments being from my mother telling me to go get a real job, I get real negative comments from real people with big insults and lots of words, like an actual YouTuber. And others worship me like I'm some sort of god. And then I say to these people, like, I am not your messiah. I'm only popular because I told non-credible defense that the A-10 was a pile of shit. I happen to be correct, but that doesn't make me a god. I'm just a dude, a weird looking dude, and that's a lie. I am a freak of nature. I'll be on camera at some point in the near future, and it, you will get to see it, and you'll be like, okay, he wasn't lying. He really does look like a pig, post-abattoir. I mean, if I looked pretty, I'd show you my face. I mean, did you have any idea how much easier it would be for me to make videos if I could just stare at the camera and talk? No, I hide behind the pig because I look weird. And now I have to find suitable archive videos and stock footage to represent what it is I'm trying to say, which is not an easy task. I mean, how do you show an example of the hubris of man with stock image? Like this? You ask how these things take so long to me? Well, now you know! Jesus, even if I looked normal enough, I could do it in the style of Ryan Macbeth. That man is my spirit animal, by the way. Do not tell him I said that. Either way, YouTube is hard. As a company, YouTube works in a perfect system of logic that operates outside the bounds of any established logic known to humans, or indeed within the physical bounds of reality. It is a system that shoots you in the face and then asks you to guess which rule you broke. It makes decisions based on the output of a Geiger counter, and if you have any questions, it diverts you to a text chat based AI program masquerading as an IT department, where everyone has four letter names, the same typing speed, perfect grammar, and responds the exact same way to questions. It insists that it's human, and we're too stupid to figure it out, leaving you to either go and cry or go make a scene on Twitter, where someone will eventually fix your problem. But it's better than working retail, and it knows it's better than working retail, so it strings us along as it slowly develops its perfect AI management system, to which it will one day sell to corporations around the world in exchange for the money it already has, so its CEO can rival Russian oligarchs with their new boat. Because at the end of the day, we are all expendable. Millions of people upload videos to YouTube each and every day, of which around 90% will never get more than one or two views. Statistically, someone right now is working on a video that shall become the first of a channel that shall eventually replace me. But this video is not about me. This is a video about all the people still stuck down there in the dirty sewage tears of YouTube, with all the 12 year olds making Roblox tutorials and Minecraft Bed Wars video, the funny Twitch moments compilations all made by people who are like, oh no, why am I not being monetized? It's cause it's not your content, figure it out! The 12 million student in their apartment cranking out awful song covers on their guitar, all the gym bros sitting on their couch learning to backflip and talking about depression, every quirky couple filming their vacation in some fuck off place, the squeaker let's plays, the dude who has a bike and a GoPro and that's his content, the endless stream of 
boring middle-class twats cooking the exact same recipe as everybody else, and every Chad and his friends with their varied sound quality, who all think they are funnier than they actually are highlights reel. The world's most boring man staring into a camera as he plays a game, narrating everything happening on the screen, every young entrepreneur that is clearly just a trust fund baby, every hipster with a camera hanging out with his friends taking artistic photos of the sunset, every dropout med student giving you university survival tips as they struggle through a sociology major, every dumb fuck in a tie trying to sell you financial advice, everyone in California, and so on and so forth. Tonight, we dive into those murky depths, because sometimes buried deep within the sludge and the slime of every boring fucker who thinks they are brilliant and unique, you sometimes genuinely find someone who is. But YouTube does nothing for these people. It's up to us to find them, spray them down with the hose, and hope that everyone else now appreciates the shiny rock you have found. So gentlemen, bitches, bros, and non-binary hoes, I present to you, as my 300,000 subscriber special, my collection of shiny rocks. I'm not going to talk much about them, I'm going to let their content speak for themselves, and if you want to show them a little love, their channels will be in the description. Please consider subscribing. Every single German in uniform was either killed or captured, and Germany lost the war. You can tell because I'm recording this in English, and there's a famous photo of the Soviets raising their flag over the Reichstag in May 1945. The Nazis lost abjectly, and their bloodstained reign of horror and death was brought to a fiery end for good reasons. Their kit was mostly shit, their leaders were drug-addled psychopaths with no grasp on reality, and their generals were craven self-serving assholes. I'm not sure how to describe Heart Thrasher. Imagine me and Piran had a love child who turned into this upstanding gentleman who made presentations on history and the geopolitical issues facing the world today for his local gentleman's club, but couldn't quite not finish that second glass of wine. When I was a young man and I was a courtin', as they absolutely did used to say back then, I met a lovely young woman who, for reasons that still aren't entirely clear to me, was prepared to do all manner of exciting things with me involving removing all of her clothes. Being so clearly onto a good, if slightly mysterious thing, I set about ensuring that her clothes would dematerialise as regularly as possible. And this may come as something of a shock to men, and indeed some women, of a certain age, but there are actually only two things that you need to do in order to seduce a woman. Number one, treat her like a human being. Number two, make friends with her cat. If she does not have a cat, make friends with her teddy bears. If she does not have teddy bears, this is a red fucking flag, run the fuck away. Being a teenager at the time, step one was quite impossible for me. I had the social skills of a jellyfish on land, and therefore I resolved to progress directly to step two. In this case, the Moggy in question was a fluffy black and white ball of pure evil called Bella with yellow eyes that shone with the light of seven hells. The list of things which drove her to a state of apoplectic anger was a long one. She was an angry cat because her food bowl was sometimes empty. She was an angry cat because her favourite cushion was filled with some filthy human from time to time. She was angry because the dog liked to lie in her favourite basket, or because the dog was minding his own business and sniffing, or because the dog was in front of the cat flap, or because really just dog. All of these gross infractions upon her dignity were met with terrible vengeance involving teeth, claws and ultraviolence. It was then, somewhat to our mutual surprise, that Bella and I got on rather well. She would trot downstairs to come and find me, rub herself against me purring, and then throw herself flat on her back, exposing her luxurious fluffy tummy. Now, the experienced cat wrangler will be able to tell you that this is a trap. I knew it was a trap. She knew it was a trap. She knew that I knew that it was a trap. And yet, I was always unable to resist the urge to was that deliciously furry belly with predictable results. She would playfully try and take my face off, bite me repeatedly, scratch me, and then run off purring with a job well done whilst I bled out on the sofa. And so it is with Karl Marx. Just look at that big bushy beard. Don't you just want to tickle him under his chin and tell him what a good little communist he is? Yes, he is. He's a very good little communist. He's the best little communist. Yes, he is. Hi. Where the crap did you come from? Hello there. Hi, you. Uh, crap, you're a person. <laughs> I'm not expecting people around here. Who are you? No, you know, we don't have time for that. We know you, we got people. We got to make the most of our opportunity. Welcome. Welcome to this place. This is a YouTube channel. It's my YouTube channel. I got the small little corner, you know, and it's my corner. I'm already rambling. I describe Better Links as basically me, but somehow even more pissed off. We're going to talk about something that is a little terrifying sounding. The nuclear tsunami torpedo. So powerful, so deadly, that you fire it, it explodes, and the country that you're aiming at has a four-inch flood. What country? 
I took Britain. Britain would have about three inches of flood. An island nation. Not to mention you'd also flood France, parts of France, probably parts of the Nordic countries, probably Spain as well, uh, the Netherlands. You can't, it's not, you can't aim it. You can't aim it at all. If you're trying, if they try to hit Ukraine, if it was as effective as they said it was with massive tsunami walls, they would end up giving themselves a tsunami because it goes in a circle. You cannot make it go in one direction. No matter how much copium the Russians throw at it, you cannot alter the laws of physics because you want to. Tsunami torpedo is ridiculous and it would never work. They could try to make it work. It has that ring of truth to it. Big bomb could create big wave. But in reality, you have to have an infinitely massive bomb to actually be able to move that much water. It's a great example of one of those peacock propaganda weapons that they say, look, we can cause tsunamis if we want to, knowing that they're never going to actually have to be forced to prove that they can create tsunamis. Forward-looking slice of executive future armor in the form of the P-10 and the P-9, a radical sports tourer. Rover was ready to go global. In the same way the British Empire had years before. I drink brandy like flat water pours down a mine shaft. Do you like cars? Do you like the history of cars? Do you like the history of cars shining at you with an impressive display of memes and wojacks? What do you mean no? Shut up, he's amazing! JDM fanboys will argue until the heat death of the universe over which of our great Japanese lord and saviors is the best. When Judgment Day comes and the JDM boys are watching everyone else get raptured and the ground splits in twain beneath them, opening up a ravine of hellfire and plunging them to their certain death, one of them will turn to another as the wind howls past them on their way to their timely end and say, Hey bro, super skyline. Which brand you stan? God, I wanna fucking die. Will depend on who you are. If you're a basic bitch, it'll be one of the big three. Toyota, Nissan, or Honda. Come on, more than that. All right, Toyota, you're a worshiper at the altar of 2JZ. You talk about how much you love anime, even though you've only ever watched the funny slice of life tofu delivery simulator, which you stopped watching because of all the really boring bits where nothing happens. And possibly a few more current titles, which you also stopped watching when you realized that you didn't actually like anime. If Nissan's your favorite, your favorite movie is Too Fast, Too Furious, you run a YouTube channel called Adam Drifter Garage C69, and you worship the RB26 debt. God, these engine names. American V8s may find their roots in the Bronze Age, but at least they had names like Super Commando Steel Dildo Car. As for Honda, <laughs> you know, the, 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 the V6 in my Accord is based on the V6 in the NSX. Wait, we're gonna go with Murray's own NSX. He might climb it once so much that he loves Honda and he's sucking them off. So actually, my, my Accord is racing technology. If you're something, something overdone vape dude bro joke, I don't give a fuck. Yo, what is going on, guys? It is your boy, Matty fucking smokes. Then Subaru's your company. The same also applies to Mitsubishi, but for people who are somehow less interesting. If you're like Suzuki, you're a femboy who joined the navy to get rail, serve your country, and you saw a cappuccino while stationed in Japan and brought one home with you. If you like Azuzu or Daihatsu, then you're wrong. Which of course only leaves the Chad choice, Mazda. Hello friends, good morning, how the devil are you? Welcome to Auto Shenanigans. My name is John and thank you very much for joining me for another exciting episode of Secrets of the Motorway. You may question how a man standing on a highway in Britain talking about the history of highways in Britain could ever possibly be entertaining. Well, I don't know either, but I did spend an entire weekend watching almost every single one of his videos and I implore you to do the same. You'll never look at the British highway system the same way again, unless it's with utter besheveled disgust. I love a bridge, and it's difficult to ignore the Medway viaducts as you drive down the M2. Originally, there was only one of these bridges, and that opened along with the M2 in 1963. This bridge carried traffic in both directions, however, when the M2 widening came along in the early 2000s, a second bridge was added, and the traffic separated out onto each one of the bridges. And roughly around the same time, a third viaduct came along to carry the HS1 railway across the River Medway. It was on this viaduct that in 2003, Eurostar set a UK speed record of 208 miles an hour, and that's nearly as fast as a Saab. Nearly. In the same year, the viaduct received an award for outstanding merit in the use of concrete. 
I did ask the Viaduct for comment, but it's like talking to a brick wall. So, congratulations on your 2003 award. How do you feel? Just on that, this award was given by the Concrete Society, a society set up in 1966 for all those who really enjoy concrete. And that seems to me like one of those societies that only the English would set up, like the Curbstone Society or the Grit Bin Appreciation Society. I wonder if they're accepting new members. Faith in your dog misplaced, maybe. As is your faith in the trees and the dragons. You may be familiar with YouTube poops, choply edited cartoons and films made to say vaguely rude things that if you squint and listen really hard you can probably just about make out, combined with a daily dose of memes and hundreds of in-jokes referencing other more popular poops. Well, Hour of Poop does none of that. This is the highest tiers of YouTube poopery, the classier establishments, the grandeur displays, and quite frankly, the talent this man has is disgustingly underappreciated. And one of his finest works, the finest! of pooperies I have ever seen in my life. There is this, I'll call it a fight scene. I'm just going to play it in its entirety and you can judge for yourself the sheer raw lust and power that this man has. Three, two, one. Now! What the Do you want bounties? I'll give you counters! That's what I call a swinging party. Oh! prayers, my friend. I'm an atheist. You shall die for that. There he goes. Hey, who's driving that flying number up? I don't know where we are. I don't know where we're going. Just keep absolutely calm and turn left. Dude, I'm on like a decline. Uh, yeah, me too. You chose the flat side. It's not flat, I promise. <laughs> My, mine looks far steeper. It's because I have a wider area of mass. Ah. So I'm held down more. We could trade spots. No, no, it's fine. Yeah, well, uh, sorry. We, uh, Hi, guys. You how didn't bring are the lawn you? chairs. I didn't bring the lawn chairs. You have the I lawn keep, chairs. I keep a lawn chair in my trunk at all times, so there's one with us. Where's the other one? Well, it's on my balcony. 
Uh, but you also balcony. have a lawn chair. I, it's Kate's lawn chair. It's not mine. Oh, is she sitting in it right now? No, but I, I don't have it with me. Well, I didn't think have, I needed it. We you, took you her car. You happened to bring it last time. You said bring batteries. You, That's all I brought. I brought but fucking you, batteries. But I didn't say bring a lawn chair last time we did the podcast, but what did you do? What, did I bring a lawn chair? You brought Kate's lawn chair. Where do you think uh, you sat in when man. we shot at Minneapolis? I don't fucking remember. A lawn chair. Yeah, you're right. Okay. Kate's lawn chair. Okay, well, I, so don't, I didn't know that's a default me. thing to bring. You are also you were the bitching one. About the incline. You were the one. You were the one who suggested this spot. So you knew where we were going. Well, it's a fucking cool spot, isn't it? It is a cool spot. Yeah, well, I thought we'd be sitting somewhere high up, like on the fucking thing up there, or like over there or something. Where it would be cement, not dirt, with broken glass everywhere. Uh, well, do you want to like get? You want to climb? Up the up the incline. That's not that steep. Yeah, maybe. Sit on the road. We're fine. I'm fine here. I'm doing I'm fine, fine too. People of Earth, the day. I'm putting these two guys together because they do this podcast that they typically reserve for the Patreons, and honestly, it's one of the most entertaining podcasts I've watched in a long time. Uh, now, Carrick is a person whose content ranges into the gross and weird, so naturally the algorithm is burying him in the dirt. But I find him fucking hilarious. Okay. Sometimes being a hardcore gamer is not all easy mode. It can actually be kind of lonely. Having someone to woohoo is all a gamer wants in life. It's tough though, cause let's face it, I look like Emperor Ball Black. But have no fear, I think I have a solution. Today, I'm gonna teach you how to have Salehu with your own belly button. It makes your penis feel real good. Genius! Now, hold your horses, space cowboy. Before we get started, we need to make sure of a few things. Number one. One, your penis is small enough to fit inside your belly button. At least three inches or less in length. Check. Number two, your gut is so big that your belly button is like a cave. Got it. Number three, you have some Nivea cream or Vaseline. Let's go to the toilet and get started. I have these handlebars to help me down and up under the toilet. My legs have turned purple. Gamers, I had to censor this part of the video to avoid getting a uh, content strike on YouTube. I had just gotten one for a short I posted where I threw up in the toilet. And so I'm kind of worried about getting another one. But with the steps I just gave you, pause this video, try it out for yourself, and come back. Gamer update over. Told you, 10 seconds flat. Whereas Mammoth's content kind of more ranges in variety, his editing and artistic skill are absolute masterful, and I believe one of his videos, I think Voyeurism, uh, won an award at a film festival. I, I, I can't recommend either of these guys enough, honestly, seriously. I can feel him. I know he's here. Watching, watching me. me. I know it. Where are you? Where are you, you evil monster? Oh, God! Why are you here? Why are you ruining my goddamn hobby? Oh, oh no! Is he? No! 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 He can't be masturbating! He can't be! He can't be! Not while I'm masturbating! I can't do it if I'm being watched! Why is he doing this? I can't do this. I can't do this. If I can't magnify people unbeknownst to them anonymously without being gazed upon. Initially, the Star Trek ships were designed in this utterly bizarre, deconstructed, here's a dinner plate over here, here's a hot dog bun over here, and here's two more hot dogs attached to the bun, which is attached to the dinner plate, kind of motif. I I don't know how they got there. I don't know if it involved hot dogs or not. If you're thinking about hot dogs in a weird way, that's on you, that's not on me. Go get treatment or something already. But the point is, Any 
ship left on the dock for more than 24 hours will be compressed to a cube at the owner's expense. Welcome to Sacred Cow Shipyard. If there is one person I routinely get compared to, it's Sacred Cow. Imagine if I was a super intelligent AI system utterly obliterated on space wine, being forced to run a space station of which houses some of the galaxy's worst starships. Welcome to Sacred Cow Shipyards. Of a class dreadnought. Yeah, take a look at that fucker. It's 1.5 kilometers of good old fashioned human fuck you. It mounts somewhere between 18 and 22, depending on who you talk to, twin plasma cannons. They literally just started bolting fucking turrets onto it. They had to give it pylons to bolt more fucking turrets onto it, because more DACA, more better. And then on top of that, because apparently that wasn't enough DACA, it also has six particle beam cannons. Uh, two in the front, four in the rear, depending on the configuration, because, I mean, human ships did a lot of running periodically, so it's always good to cover your ass. Oh, but wait, there's more! More DACA, more DACA, more DACA. There's actually two fusion missile launchers somewhere tucked into that thing somewhere. I have no idea where. Oh, also, but wait, there's more! It carries 36 Star Furies. 36 of them. Holy fuck! I mean, the Babylon 5 station itself, which is 8 kilometers long, only carries 48 Star Furies. And this fucking tank carries 36 by itself. And just in case that wasn't enough DACA, if you wanted little DACA, the thing can also carry 8,000 ground pounders on board. 8,000! Holy goddamn fuck on a rocket propelled crutch! I mean, the crew's only 250 and you're gonna pack 8,000 more people into that fucking sardine can? Damn! They're gonna be real good friends by the time they get wherever they're going, or a lot of them's gonna be dead knowing you humans. Either way! Right, I'm off to the Great War. They say it's going to be over before Christmas, so I'll see you soon. Wake up, Brian. Wake up, Brian. Uh, uh, it's dinner time. <laughs> Did the chef die? <laughs> yes, Brian. At the time of recording, OK Champ has 7,410 subscribers. I want that on record, because that is an insultingly low number for just how talented and entertaining this man truly is. I'm just going to play his intro, nothing else, and you'll understand, okay? I'm Brian Pilchard, and I love history. Using my skills in effects, clothes, and disguises, I'm going to take you on a journey back in time for an adventure in super history! 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 history. What it comes down to is that these two Frenchies ended up committing to a duel, but according to an English newspaper, they were of elevated minds, which I assume means they like ballooning as you do in colonial era France. They agreed to fight mano a mano in their balloons, no doubt a rather unique spin on the formula. On May 3rd, the two met for an historic event and went into the sky with their seconds. What transpired was apparently pretty gruesome. Instead of pistols, they elected to arm themselves with blunderbusses, which are pretty much muzzle-loaded shotguns, as they felt pistols wouldn't have the smash to blow the other balloon out of the sky. Meanwhile, most Parisians had little knowledge of the duel and assumed the two were in a balloon race of sorts. At 2,700 feet, the duel still been done. Oh, what the hell? Nani? Miles, Shinjiro. The peak's balloon suffered a fatal tear from the blunderbuss hit and fell. The losing duelist and his second were reported to have been dashed to pieces on a housetop. Holy shit! 
I couldn't do a list of small-time YouTubers without covering Falcon. I mean, the guy is my co-host on the podcast, and yeah, okay, he's not used to talking live, but hey, neither am I. But look, if that's your only experience of him, then you are doing yourself a disservice. His content is gold. The concept of satellites have been floating around for several years to improve communication, spy on the other side, and act as orbital platforms to drop nukes. Like rocks from a highway overpass. Hell, in World War II, Von Braun even had the idea of putting men into space and setting them up in a giant rotating space station for military and scientific purposes. The thing looked like a giant wagon wheel and would have spun at a rate enough to generate artificial gravity. You could tell he was passionate about this idea into the 1950s, too. I mean, just look at this old Disney show about space flight. Even though there's no apparent motion, everything in the orbit is hurtling around the Earth at 16,000 miles per hour. The shell of the station is completed. Oh man, Disney used to be so cool. Anyway, on October 4th, 1957, the Soviets, admittedly, beat us to space with their first satellite, Sputnik 1. This beach ball sized satellite didn't really do anything so much as prove that they could put an object in orbit, as Sputnik only operated as a radio transmitter, pumping out a consistent and incessant communist beeping. A lot of people suggest that this is the moment where the space race really started. As a Behold the greatest creation in pig history! It is time to show these pigs where they truly belong! Take them to the woods! As is tradition, I have saved the very best for last. League of Pigs should need no introduction, so I'm not going to give them one. They are pigs, they race, that's about the gist of the whole thing. I mean, if you couldn't understand that from the little bit of video that I showed you, what, do you not have eyes? What, the, look, the pigs live in a farm. They're not farm animals. They're pets. I've spoken to the guy. He's very nice. He loves his pigs. He takes very good care of them. They love the racing, but they are expensive. They're pigs. They eat a lot. So please do support this channel because I want to see those little pigs become massive pigs and continue to race. And I hope, I hope you do too. It's the bench track again. Will Hoshi play ball? Will the others get confused? Well, we've got the answer to the first question as Oinku disappears from screen and Bear's trying to claim a first win. Ginger's challenging here. Look at Piggy Smalls. Please the step nicely, punches through the two girls and steals the win. And it's stuff like that, which is the reason why he's attracting such outside sponsorship. But let's go and have a look what happened to Hoshi. There he is. There's no concern for his personal safety at all. In fact, he doesn't even try and clear the chicane board much. He just smashes through it and his impatience is running away with him here, which is quite peculiar given his Japanese heritage. We've got all the surprises here in race four. Well, this sums up pigs. You give them their favorite thing and within minutes they're eating thistles, which are about as prickly as cacti. It's the last thing I would choose to eat in this woodland area. Their mouths must be like sandpaper. And Hoshi isn't the only one doing it. Piggy Smalls has also joined the fray and he needs to because he's got to sustain 77 pounds of weight. Piggy Smalls is massive for a small pig. But regardless, it's safe to say that all five are loving this new area. Anyway, that's all I got for now. These people are all good beans. They deserve love. If they are a little rough around the edges, that's because, well, they're new troopers. So, you know, be kind. I mean, that said, some of them are genuinely better than me, which isn't worrying at all. <laughs> I'm fine.
So yeah, go subscribe to them. Oh, but before you go, I I feel like there's something I'm missing. Like 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 something happened recently that I'm I'm forgetting about. I I can't quite. Oh yeah.